Ah, ça marche. <coughs> Très bien. Donc, so, uh, I, I, I speak French <laughs> again. <laughs> Bad habit. Uh, so we were talking about uh, the Tio Kingdom, and so then the next book was Children of Wood. Yes. So back in uh, back in uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo here, and the Cuba. Right. After your PhD. So that book was one that I felt more and more was necessary to write. To correct or to complement the earlier work. Right. You know, earlier I had published, first I had published basically what was amounts to all the raw data with some explanations um, in, uh, in, in the PhD, in Dutch, which was essentially my un the unchanged PhD, PhD version from 1957 or something right. like that. But that was clearly not, not, you know, not enough. And it was clearly rough in that it essentially gave the vision of what people told me and what the people who told me were all people basically, essentially, in the capital and they were all related to the royal family in one way or another, which one could find in a graph here and there. So um, it became more and more evident that this was the, if you want, the vision on the past of that elite group, mm -hmm. but not necessarily what that really happened. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, did you realize that because of the Two Kingdom book? Well, I, I realized that as I was working, um, you know, in the in the sixties in general, mm -hmm. whatever I was working, because it was obvious in Rwanda. Yeah. You know, Rwanda is a parallel situation where the first thing you get is quote unquote the official version. Right. And then you see that it doesn't work. Now this one became possible because I, as I was thinking this over, um, I also realized, and I did realize this early on, from the earliest 60s on, that you could use language mm. and linguistics to check on some historical data. Mm. And I had done that, by the way, in the Chop Kingdom the already. Kingdom or uh, around it. So I decided to do this seriously. Mm -hmm. And because we knew by then, by the later 60s and early 70s, that there was a relationship between the Kuba language and the languages from the Central Forest in Congo, for which there is a magnificent dictionary, uh, the Mongol dictionary, which at the, at the time was one of the three best in anywhere mm -hmm. in Bantu studies. Uh, so I decided to systematically compare you know, my whole vocabulary um, with the whole vocabulary I had with the Mongol vocabulary mm -hmm. and see if I could find out wh whether, what kind of relationships there were and if they were regular. And I found an enormous amount of data. I found data not only on Pushong words that are related to the Mongol ones and have a common ancestry or not. I also found a lot about Bouchon loanwords from other languages like Chiluba and from other languages still. Mm -hmm. So, but that was all full of historical information. Mm -hmm. And this was information that had not been used, at least not in African studies as far as I, or African history as far as I know, by anyone. Mm -hmm. It had been used in Europe for European problems, but only to a very partial degree and in a very biased way mm -hmm. during the 1930s to establish, you know, basically it had been used mostly by uh, those who wanted to try to show that there was a Germanic undertow in most of Western Europe that was older or more important than whatever Roman Thing there was, and it was extremely flawed. It was, ex you know, it was 1920s, 1930s, and mostly in Holland, by the way. Oh, yeah. um, and so I knew that, it, that theoretically this could be done, but I also knew something about what not to do. Mm. Uh, but still, and so you, were, I wrote you were a this. bit improvising on your own. Yes. Yeah, and I see the the list of. Uh, 
The lexical list is enormous. It's so uh, yes, I use an I use a huge amount of lexical data. Lexical comparison. I, I put yeah. them in appendix. Mm -hmm. I got the university press to approve all of this and to do this. And they uh, said yes. And to publish it. It's almost a hundred pages. Yes, I know. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's you know it's based on what three thousand Cuba Bouchon words. Right. And their their comparisons in many other languages, right. so it, it was a big job. It, it took many years. Um, and, you know, once I had the results, then it became clear in which ways that elite history had in fact diverged from or was different from what had basically been going on. So you get a hybrid book. Hmm. You get a book with a first part that gives you the history according to the establishment. Right. And then you get a second part, which gives you the history according to all other data, mm -hmm. um, you know, for about the same period. And the data are synthesized. Of course, you're not going to give each of these little, little things separately. So they're synthesized and um, they begin to make sense. Right. With the economic data make a lot of sense. The there's a, yeah, there's a very important uh, economic right. chapter again mm -hmm. on uh, the who and the quarry. Now, of course, if I had to rewrite this, I would still change some things. Really? I think I would. Um, there would be more information to, to share, uh, more doubts, in fact, and and you can analyze further for early periods in Cuba history than what I have here. Mm -hmm. um, I do not. I do not think that before the mid 18th century or early 18th century, the data are all that safe. And it's, it's, it, at, at the time it was difficult to see. But now we know from the analysis of objects and styles, mm. um, and also from looking again at the genealogy and not just me, but, uh, but a number of other researchers, that essentially, yes, you are sure of your chronology down to about 1700. Right. And before that, um, it's clear that nothing is really pinned down. Mm -hmm. It has also become more, more visible to me since then, because of practice, that the, the, amongst the early stories, we have a lot of what anthropologists would call myths and what the Hirsch later handled as myths. In other words, there are made up stories mm -hmm. that come from other stories that come either from general tales that were told around or have some local input and then some general input mixed it's very hard to say what but you know that you cannot trust them to the level of what you can mm -hmm. after about 1700 and when you do that and when i add uh, something um, we may talk about perhaps later uh, what I know now about how memory works, it is very, it is clear to me that um, if I had to rewrite this, I should start this as a, as a real history. I should start this around 1700 mm -hmm. and not say 1600 or earlier. Mm -hmm. So that's that. So um, <clears throat> it makes me think that uh, maybe the next book we could talk about, maybe not today, but another day, would be the third installment of your Cuba <laughs> history, which is being colonized, uh, and see how because in, so this was. Did, did you do more field research for this one? No, I'm no. So you use what you had in your PhD, your dissertation, yes. uh, plus the, the, the vocabulary, right? Plus other, plus a, a, a few additional data. You know, like what early travelers were told. Mm. what the earliest missionary in the, right. the region, uh, Shepherd, was told, mm. um, what the earliest businessman, right. uh, Vermeulen, whose data became only available in 2012, you know, right. the manuscript data. You didn't have it at the time. Oh, no, 2012 is much later. Right. I right. didn't even know that existed. Well, they, they also has a little comment. I also saw the original notes of Frobenius mm. later on, uh, also has some comment on this. What these things do 
is they tell me, these early writers, they tell me essentially not only what the official versions were around 1900, but who told whom, what to whom. Mm -hmm. So I can track down, let's say, the, the versions in early writers such as Daudet or Frobenius to one particular person mm -hmm. who was a person who had been sheltered by the American mission, but they don't know about this, about the American mission in 1896 and exactly where in the genealogy all of this comes together. So, you know, how more vulnerable all of this is right. than it looks later on, you know. So, um, uh, is this after the Children of Good that you, or before, uh, when did you write uh, Oral History, the book on Oral History? The second one. Yes. Uh, the second one I would write later, but you know, ever since the original oral history, mm -hmm. which was published 1960, 1965 in English, and it's so the it English was, version. So the oral history was right after the Chow Kingdom, or before the Chow no, Kingdom? No, the, the original oral history was written in 65, is it? Uh, 1956. 56. But that was not published. I see. And it okay. then served for the PhD in 1957. I added all through 57 and 60. Okay. I then wrote a French version in 1960, which I deposited in Belgium before I came here. Right. Uh, that was published in Belgium. Right. The, the La Tradition Orale is 1960. Okay. And um, it was translated only. It was translated and published in English five years later. Right, 65. And I never 66. saw the translation. There are some real mistakes in that there translation. There are mistakes. Oh, really? yes. Right. So, um, yeah, so it, it, I was just curious if... Uh, so, the book uh, de la tradition orale and oral history had not been influenced by your revisiting of the Cuba history. Well, all so, of that was in there, you know, yes, uh, yes. of course. It, you see, the, you can also see this in the Journal of African History. If you look at the very first issue of the journal, mm. it has a, supposedly a Cuba history in it. Mm. But it has two parts. Part one is oral tradition. Okay. And of course, for a PhD, you realize that if you're going to have a PhD in history, you first have to explain how your sources can right. be valid. So, exactly. so the whole tradition oral was just an introduction. Your methodological to whole, introduction. Yes, to the Cuba history. Right. Uh, okay, so uh, do you, would you like us to talk a little bit to, uh, of past or do you want us to wait for that next time? Well, I think perhaps it's better to wait for past for next time because it's a long story. It's a very long story. Uh, do you think maybe we can we could have five ten minutes? Uh, just I mean, talk, jumping ahead. Yes, of course. On the uh, being colonized. Yes. So it's, because being colonized. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but so it's your third and final. And, yes. Work you didn't go Cuba. back. In between, right? You didn't go no, back I did to not go back in between, but I accumulated more sources. And in fact, I had sources mm -hmm. that I had not used in these yeah, Cuba histories sure. because they were for the colonial period. Right. So, and I had published. But you had collected them. I had collected them. I had published articles in French and, and published in Kinshasa, essentially two or three, making a total of 100 to 150 pages mm -hmm. on that colonial period. Um, but, you know, um, as we will see when, when you look at being colonized, um, this was a way of explaining history in general, using the Cuba only as one example, because you did have, by the time I wrote it, a lot of material that, that showed that came from the side, it didn't come from the top, it didn't come from the very bottom. Some of it did, but most of it came from what, what has been called sideways <laughs> right. um, information. But it, it shows much better how people yeah. 
accept you know, are being colonized than exactly the official versions of how civilization or whatever it is is imposed or the anti-version how you know the iron hand of such and such imposes stuff right and uh, so it and it also covers a period that you did not really cover. No, we covered the period that had not covered right. on purpose in the earlier work. Mm -hmm. So, um, and using a, a really Cuba viewpoint on what happened to I them. I used all the oral history, mm -hmm. you know, that I had gathered when I was there, um, and I. I admit that I could have gathered more, except that people didn't want to talk about it right. very much. And also I mean, this was the colonial period, <coughs> and they weren't too sure yet. Yeah. They were beginning to be too sure, but they were beginning to be sure enough, but not, not enough yet. Also, there were major differences between the capital, which was relatively well protected, and outlying villages that mm. were sometimes, yes, sometimes much worse off. So that would have required, you know, again, um, an aerial survey and an aerial study that might have taken a year or a year and a half to have enough divergent mm, histories and enough point of views from all layers of society to really come to a firm conclusion. Right. That but you, you do because you have also uh, the dreams. Well, you see, I have some of the dreams. Yes, I have some of that information. <laughs> I also have indirect material, um, like you know, from such things as tax records I collected, right. um, indirect indications as to who collected the taxes actually, right. and the factories and all the movements of the. So slaves and uh, yes, and the uh, refugees. That came. Uh, that comes out of um, uh, judicial documents, mm -hmm. OPG, OPG, the police judiciaire, which um, and they were supposed to write down what witnesses said, more or less literally, and never literally, really. But mm -hmm. you know, oft, if they were devoted to it the agents, it would come out in great detail. And there were a few of these very detailed cases in um, that history that help set, fill in the background. You know. And did you, uh, <coughs> did you also uh, see the sources we were talking about uh, together from the factory, the factory agents and the... No, I did not have that information yet. Yeah, um, yet. That was later. Uh, yeah. You know, it, at that point, at the point when that book was written, I was looking for this person. Mm. Because, um, you, you know, I, that... I knew that he'd written two novels and I'd read, read the novels and I realized they were based on, on personal information. But I could not use much of that information. Mm -hmm. I used a little because it's not... It's not guaranteed whether this is fiction or fact. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever you say, <laughs> you, yeah. you have to know. Yeah. So it's only after that book was written mm -hmm. that it fell by chance, a reference to it fell by chance in the hands of this Dutch person who was looking for somebody who knew about his grand grandparent and his grandparent's name was in there. So the name was authentic, mm -hmm. um, and he contacted me by email and so on and so forth. You know. right. So what happened to these archives? You didn't have a chance. Well, the, to the archive them. we prepared it completely electronically, and by the way, the the, the, the person who found it is an electronic expert. So mm -hmm. you know, he really we really prepared everything. The whole book is finished. The footnotes are finished, and everything. It was going to be published by. Um, a well-known Dutch publisher, the Koninklijk Institute, the tropical, the, the Royal Institute for Tropical Studies mm -hmm. in, in Amsterdam. But they went bankrupt. Oh. They are a state institution, but they were bankrupt. They could, they could no longer publish it. So after that, it went to several other publishers, yeah. each of whom tried to see if it could be published. And basically they found that they, they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, it also was submitted at that point to a Belgian series on Africa, in an official one, and they decided to put it up, God knows, maybe 10 years or 15 years, in favor of such things as, you know, 
reactions to Kim bang um, <laughs> by the Protestant missions, you know, stuff like that. And But uh, I'm not sure I understand who wrote the book then, uh, this person who... Uh, the person... Is it a book or it's a catalogue no, no. of... Uh, you see, what happened is that the, the, the grandfather, the person we're talking about, wrote his memoirs ah, and he wrote and rewrote his memoirs. Oh, so it's a book with the memoirs. And, and the book some... is basically an edition of his memoirs. I see. Uh, and because the memoirs are so long right. and he had rewritten several versions of it, so uh, it essentially is always, if possible, the latest version. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there are variants, they are indicated the latest version of the of the memoirs, but it is essentially an edition of memoirs with the types of annotations that you have, like text annotations and or, and then footnotes and then background information on the person. Right. By now, my you know the the grand the, the descendant of this ancestor has found out practically everything there is to know. Mm -hmm. um, we started with nothing and we ended up with knowing when he was divorced, why he was divorced, how he remarried, what he tried to do in between. And in a way it's become interesting as a career history for uh, somebody who wants to work, you know, for somebody who worked in the colonies and who was also trying, was trying to find a foot in his own country and start a business there mm -hmm. and it wouldn't work and then he would go back to the and you know it's a, it is one of those complicated stories but so is he a very good uh, observer right or? so right now at this moment that version is with an archive in the hague which is a, um, an archive that specializes in memoirs and the like of former colonials, wherever, and um, mostly in, in the Dutch Indies, of course, right. being Holland. Uh, but we're still hoping that we are going mm -hmm. to get a publisher because, um, you know, people are interested, but it is a question of funding. And we right. will still come up with some funding. Right. So maybe we can uh, stop here and... Yeah. Um, and start next time again. Exactly, I think... So. And start next time again. Exactly, I think so.